So if you've been with us uh, for a while, for, um, we've been going through the book of Hebrews uh, and uh, for several months. Um, and uh, incidentally, it's actually the same book that my small group has been going through. Um, and uh, it's been great. Um, we've actually been going at a slightly uh, faster clip uh, than, than, um, than we have here at church. Um, and one of the things uh, that you notice is um, it, he tends to repeat himself sometimes. Um, and uh, and um, so the author is speaking to a group of uh, Hebrew believers, right, who have stepped out of Judaism uh, or really just realized that the end of um, really Orthodox Judaism, of, of, of following what um, they believe is Jesus, right? And so they've stepped out and now they've started following Jesus um, and um, recognize Jesus as the Messiah. He is the hope of the world. He's the one that they've been waiting for their entire lives or their entire culture um, and people group have been waiting for. Um, and so they started following him. Um, but this group has come under persecution recently. Uh, and so what's happened is now they're wondering, um, now Jesus doesn't seem like that great of a savior anymore. Um, they're, they're being pressured by their Hebrew brothers, or by their Jewish brothers and sisters uh, to return back to Judaism. Um, and now the Roman authorities are kind of cracking down on them a little bit. And now Jesus doesn't seem that great of a savior anymore, right? Uh, and so the, their temptation uh, right now is to say, you know, was Jesus even really that worth it? Uh, or not Jesus, was, was Jesus that worth it? Was, is Jesus really that great of a guy? I mean, aren't we kind of overhyping him a little bit? Um, he just seems like a really good prophet, a, a really good man of God. He just seems slightly un, um, maybe just a really good guy who is kind of unjustly treated, right? And thank goodness we don't go through these same thoughts in, in our day. Uh, but the author of Hebrews lays out um, in a systematic way why Jesus is greater and how Jesus is better. In fact, that, that's the entire theme of the book. And so when we're going through our small group, I remember one day, uh, probably after chapter 8 or 9, um, and, and I got home, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, we have the same application again. Jesus is better. And I was like, really, when are you going to get to good, good stuff? And then uh, the Holy Spirit kind of punched me in the face, and it was like, well, whenever you get that, Jesus is better. And I was like, okay, fair enough. Um, and so in, in a bunch of letters, he, he explains logically how Jesus is better, how Jesus is greater. Um, and so he's going to say Jesus as the Son of God is greater than the angels, and so we better listen to him. Um, the revelation that he brings. And then uh, he says Jesus um, is greater than Moses. In that fa and so we look to him as our um, great uh, prophet who leads us into the rest that God has to offer. And then he says Jesus is our true great high priest um, from heaven who intercedes on our behalf. Um, and so we, we look to him, we come to him. And then he, he gives us this little teaser, or at least for, for the Jewish audience is a teaser. He mentions this guy named, named Melchizedek. Right? And Melchizedek, he's this guy, he has like two lines in the entire New Testament, and he has confounded Hebrew or Jewish scholars for years, or not for years, for centuries. Right? So for a long time, everyone's been trying to figure out who this guy is, why he appears in Scripture. He's apparently a priest of God, but no one knows where he came, where he came from. And so the Jewish believers, are, he mentions him, and so now they're like, okay, wow, he's, he's got his audience hooked, right? And then he stops, and that's where we find ourselves this morning. Um, he gives a big pause, and, um, and he's going to literally call his audience a bunch of babies, right, a bunch of children. It, this is a great, uplifting, encouraging sermon, trust me. Um, but he's going to call them babies, and um, the sermon just been, uh, or the text really has been um, interacting with me a lot. Um, it's been convicting me a lot, um, even to the point of even this morning, um, and um, I pray that it it, it does the same for you guys. Um, but, 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 but here's where we're going with this. Um, here's what the author of Hebrews is going to say. Uh, he's going to say that it is the mark of every healthy Christian to be spiritually growing by, uh, and maturing by hearing and responding uh, to the Word of God. Let me read that again. It is the mark of every healthy Christian to be spiritually growing and maturing by hearing and responding to the Word of God. Um, so if you've got your Bibles, uh, you can open it up to Hebrews chapter 5. If you don't have a copy of the scriptures, uh, it'll be up on the screen behind me. Um, and we're going to start at verse 11, and we're going to go to 6 verse 3. Now about this, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. 
For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Uh, so if you'd bow your heads and pray with me. Um, I ask you guys to take a second. Um, pray silently to yourselves um, that this text um, would speak to you um, and would the Holy Spirit would reveal the truth to you. And now would you take a second and uh, pray for me that the Holy Spirit would speak through my words, um, speak despite my words, um, and that Jesus would be glorified. Father, I come before you this morning um, acknowledging that it is a great task and responsibility in front of me to expound um, your holy scripture, Lord, your word that you have uh, given to us to reveal yourself and to reveal Jesus. Father, I pray, Lord, that um, this morning that you would do what my words and my wisdom um, and my rhetoric cannot do, Lord, and that is change hearts, Lord God, that, that, that you would uh, mature your believers, Lord God, your children, God. Um, I pray that you are lifted up, Lord, um, and that I'm not. Be glorified. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So this text we have here, what he's saying is, um, he's saying, look, again, he's talked about the, the high priest, and he's talked about Melchizedek, and now he's saying, look, takes a pause, and I want to tell you more about this. Okay? I want to tell you more about this, but there's a problem, um, because, and, and, and not because it's, it's a complicated thing to, to explain, uh, not because it's, it's, it's something um, that, that I can't use with words, but there's, the problem is because the audience has become dull of hearing. Right? And other translations will have sluggish uh, in hearing. Um, and so uh, this, in, in order to expand, we've got to figure out what this means. Because honestly, this is not just a phrase that we use every now and then, right? Um, we don't use dull of hearing. No one here has ever accused someone else um, of being dull of hearing. Um, if you have, um, come talk to me and I'll give you, you know, a list of words we use in the 21st century. Um, but, and so, so we need to figure out what it means. And that word dull, what it means... Um, in the Greek, it means sluggish. It means lazy. And so what he's saying is, I can't explain this to you because you become lazy of hearing. And so that still gives us a little bit of a problem. Um, but what he's saying here um, is that you're not actively listening, right? And so, so we kind of understand this at, at some level because we know nowadays that or we distinguish between hearing and listening, right? Um, and so he, uh, they're both kind of mean the same thing. They both involve the same processes, um, but he, uh, in the fact that you, you know, you hear um, audio notes, I'm, I'm not a speech pathologist, um, you, you hear things, it hits your, you know, the sound waves hits your eardrums, um, and so, but what happens is, is a difference, right? And so, so you can sit here and you can hear me, um, but you can hear me kind of like uh, you hear the traffic as you're sitting on 635, right? Or as you hear the music uh, when you're in the doctor's office. It's just, it's kind of background noise. Um, and the other difference is you're listening. And when you're listening, it, it's the fact that you are hearing, but then it actually does, you actually actively engage in it, right? You, you do something with it. You, you, you work with it. Um, and so uh, if you're a guy in here, um, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, in, in, well, if you're a guy and you're dating someone or you have dated someone, and I would think that if you're married, then... Um, People don't change too much, so I, I, I think uh, if, if you're married, then this is the same thing, right? Um, and so um, I've, I've been in situations before where, um, you know, talking to a girl, and, and you don't even have to be dating her, you can just keep talking to a girl, right? And, and most girls just talk, and then they'll keep talking and talk and talk and talk. Um, I, I don't know why, but they love to, my sister loves to talk, right? And so after a while, 
Um, girls use a free one. Guys kind of have ADD after five seconds, right? And so girls are talking. And so then we start, you know, thinking about, you know, sports or, or food or, or, or the playoffs or TV or, you know, movies or the life cycle of an amoeba. I don't know. You know, we, we, our mind just wanders, right? And eventually, uh, the girl is kind of smart and she realizes that the guy is physically there, but he's not mentally, right? So um, she'll say, hey, um, do you hear me? And, and guys, you know, we're, if, if you're good at it, you kind of catch certain words and you just snap out of it. Yay. Yeah, baby. I heard you, um, and and then uh, and then you know you'll repeat the last five words that she said, and and um, it's okay. But um, and I can attest to this because I've had this had multiple. Yes, but did you listen to me? And then that's when we get in trouble, right? Uh, because there's something different that happens when you actually actively engage in what's saying. Like like it, it comes down and uh, you're working with it, and that's what he's getting at when he says dull of hearing. It means you're not listening. You're not paying attention. Uh, you're, and so you're not understanding. Um, the writer goes, I have so much I want to tell you, but it's hard um, because you're not paying attention to any of it. Uh, right? They'd gone to a place where God's word and the gospel, frankly, had lost its appeal. It wasn't as exciting to them. It wasn't as beautiful. Um, it wasn't captivating them. It wasn't enthralling them. It wasn't beautiful. And so they weren't engaging in it. It wasn't changing them. They heard it, but they weren't listening to it. And what happened is when they weren't pursuing the gospel, other things uh, began taking their, their minds, right? They're pursuing other things with a greater passion, concentrating their efforts um, and thoughts and endeavors on, on other things, you know, things like occupation uh, and their culture um, and their services. And somewhere along the way, the passion for the gospel just sort of died. And the author, and the author says, and this is how I know you're not uh, listening, because you guys ought to be teachers by now, all right? Um, but you're not. There's a clear indication here, what he's saying is that there should be growth in the Christian life, right? There, there, there is forward movement in the Christian life. Now, he's not saying that everyone is called to stand up here um, and, and teach, right? Or everyone's not called to, uh, to, um, to, to, to stand in front of a class and teach or preach or, or anything like that. But there is a sense that you and I should be able to sit across the table from someone and explain who Jesus is and explain uh, the gospel and, and what he offers and what that looks like. Um, there's a progression in the Christian faith that if you're following Jesus, you should be growing in knowledge and understanding and faith. You should eventually be maturing into a leader or into a teacher, sorry. And so you're not listening. And even though you should be teachers, uh, you should be teaching others about Jesus. You can't because you can't even get these elementary principles, right? And so it says in verse 12, so for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. And I'm not sure if you just if you caught this, but he just called his audience a bunch of children. right? He says, look, what you're supposed to be doing is you're supposed to be you know, chewing on some steak, but instead you're, you're just sipping on a bottle and just drinking milk. right? Only children, only babies need milk. Um, we we, we kind of know that, right? Our, so our pastor, Sam, and his wife are expecting their third child. Third child. And so we are celebrating with them. We are happy uh, for them, you know, for, for another little rug rat running around here. Now, if in a few months, um, Sam and Anne bring their baby here, and the little baby boy is sitting up here, and, or sitting on, on the chair or in his little thing, and he's sipping on a bottle of milk, right? None of us say, oh! Oh, stop that. You know, that's just disgusting. Stop it. Right? That, that's weird. Right? Because it'd be normal for a baby to be sipping on a bottle of milk. Right? Um, now, if in a couple months, uh, Sam shows up here, and he's rolling around the ground, he's got a bottle of milk in his hand, um, then something's off. Right? I mean, I love the guy. He's my pastor, but I'm calling the cops and pulling the straight jacket out. Uh, right? Because grown men don't get their nutrition from baby bottles of milk. All right? Um, now, he's not saying that milk is bad, okay, so, 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 so don't get that. Milk is not bad because if you're, if you're young in the faith, milk is good. Milk is what grows you. Um, if, if, you're, if you start following Jesus, drink it up. Um, but don't be ashamed of it. It will strengthen you in your bodies. But if you've been following Jesus for 15, 20, 25, 30 years, and you're still sipping on a bottle, bro, you've got to grow up. Uh, is what he's saying. Um, if we saw 
a 28-year-old solely living off milk, we would not call that normal. In fact, he probably wouldn't even look very normal. Right? He wouldn't look very healthy. Um, if a person is still a baby when they're old enough to be a teenager, old enough to be adults, there's something very wrong. Now, we, we know this process uh, about babies because Jesus talks about it. Uh, one day, um, a, a leader of uh, the Jewish synagogue approaches Jesus, uh, and Jesus tells him, you have to be born again. And the guy's like, what? You want me to get back into my mom's womb? I, I can't do that. And Jesus says, no, you have to be born again. And this, is, this concept that we know that if you're in Christ, you're a new creation, you're a new creature. And, and so there's a process where you grow. And so this audience, they can't handle deeper teaching because they're still only accustomed to processing the milk. And so church, the question is, why are they not maturing? Right? That, that, that's the obvious question. Why are they not growing? Um, verse 14 tells us, But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And here it is. The reason they've stopped growing is because they've stopped living out their faith. Right? Um, and this is a result of dull hearing. They've stopped applying the truth that they know into how they live. And they've become stagnant, staying in this perpetual state of infancy. And they're no longer responding to the revelation of God that they've received. See, the, the dull of hearing is not a physical issue, right? It's not a physical issue. It's a spiritual issue of the heart. Because what it means is you hear the word of God, and it comes into your ears, but then it gets down into your heart, and then it's met by a hard substance. It's met by, by a heart or a heart that's getting hardened. And it's not, it's not embraced uh, with faith and love. The teaching is not. It's not a physical problem. And maybe you'll hear the gospel, and, and maybe you know, you'll, you'll get some warm feelings about it. Maybe it'll get you some, some warm fuzzies, and, and, or maybe you'll feel good about it. But then you walk out the doors and your life doesn't look any different. Your life is not changed by the truth that you've heard. And your heart is not warmed by the fire of the gospel. And you know that you know that Jesus has forgiven you of all your sins, right? You know that you're a new cre creature, but you have a hard time forgiving others of their sin. See, a mark of Christian maturity is that you hear the word of God and you respond to it. The word of God reveals the will of God. Uh, it reveals who we are in Jesus and our standing with him and our righteousness in Jesus. And in fact, it reveals Jesus himself. But, you're not, but if you're not responding to any of those truths, then you're not growing. You just gain a bunch of head knowledge, right? You, and, and what happens is if you know the word of God, but you don't do the will of God, you just become a really educated spiritual infant. See, somewhere along the way, this group of believers, they started off well. They started off with a passion. They started off growing they were changed by the word of God, and, and, and it changed something in them. And they began following Jesus, and they were growing, and then something stopped. And they pra stopped practicing their faith, even though they still profess Jesus. And, and that's the, they didn't completely walk away. They're still professing Jesus. They're still going to uh, church, but they just weren't living it. They're not applying the truth that they know. See, spiritual infants have no problems hearing the word of God. You know, in fact, they probably hear it a lot. Spiritual infants probably, you know, read devotionals a lot, and they might listen to eight different podcasts and be in four different small groups, right? And, and, and they'll attend church uh, on Sundays, you know, and, and, and tweet Bible verses, right, encouraging uh, verses, and, you know, 140 characters or less. And they hear the word of God, and they'll say, this is great. This is beautiful. This is what I needed. Isn't our God great? Isn't the gospel great? And they'll hear it. And they'll walk out the doors, and nothing will have changed in their lives. They, they know the truth. It's all up in their heads, but they don't live it. See, nothing will have changed before, and they'll continue struggling with the same sins, right? Sins that I struggled with five years ago, I'm still struggling. Fifteen years ago. And, and they'll battle it the same way. You see, Paul will use um, this term, infant, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 where he'll say, look, I want to treat you as older, um, as, as older Christians. I want to treat you as mature, but I can't because you're still living after the world. Because, you, in fact, you don't look very different from the world. You're in Christ, but you've just been birthed. 
They don't live lives that are glorifying and honoring to God. In fact, they, you really can't distinguish them. And in fact, it might not even be overt immoral sinfulness, right? It, it, it might not be, you know, debauchery and drunkenness and uh, licentiousness, right? But it can just be you have no passion for growing in Christ, right? The, the, the Bible sits on your desk and it, it, it gathers dust and your knees haven't hit the floor in months. Um, you're not meeting uh, with, 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 with believers. You're not growing. And this is why the author is having a hard time explaining this. Um, he wants to teach them deeper truths, but they're barely grasping the surface. In fact, we say it all the time here. We're like, take us deeper. We want to grow deeper. Sam, teach us what the Word of God has to say. We want to know. And we're barely able to grasp what's on top. And if you're anything like me, this, this really hits home. Um, and as I was studying this passage, I, I, one of the most humbling things to realize, I mean, I, I know this, but realizing was the author of Hebrews knew exactly what was going on in my heart in the 21st century. That somewhere in my walk with the Lord, um, I stopped living it out. And I was lazy in applying it, right? Like, like I knew it, but I just didn't want to live it. I, I, I learned things every week by, by coming here to uh, church, learning things every week, and, and with my small group and with, with school. Um, but I look back, and the Bryce of 2010 looks a whole lot like the Bryce of 2013. I, 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 my sins are still there, but, but, but the fact that I still, the way I battle them, the way I war with them, the exact same way. And clearly not working. But, but I still try to throw the same, uh, same, same, same efforts at them. Right? Uh, the, the, the way I approach missions and evangelism is, is the exact same way. One of the things I realized this week um, was that, as I was going through this, is that um, this concept of Sabbath, right? The, that, that God created Sabbath uh, for us, for our good, uh, for, uh, for our physical and spiritual good, right? A, a moment where we can rest physically and rest in God. And I realized, man, I haven't done that in months, you know, and even though I know it, I know I'm supposed to be doing it. Uh, in fact, someone from my small group told me to do it this past Sunday, and I was like, yeah, 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 and I completely forgot about it. In fact, I preach it to others. Are you Sabbathing? Or, 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 or are you resting? No, you really should. Look, Jesus tells us to, okay? It's really good for you. And yo, I, I, I wasn't doing it. I hadn't done it in months. And God was telling me, yeah, yeah, preach this text, Bryce. Preach this text. Let me preach to you first. I realized that there were some areas in my life that I was walking in open disobedience to God, um, even though I, know it, I knew it wasn't glorifying Him. Right? That, that, that it didn't reflect the gospel that I so clearly knew, so clearly embraced. I, 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 again, like I said, I come to church every Sunday, and uh, the books that I read are Christian books. I mean, my textbooks, I go to Bible class, and my textbooks are Bible books, right? I listen to podcasts. I'm part of a small group, and, and I'm in, inundated with all this information and all this spiritual truth. And I said, yes, that is so, that is so good. I'm writing this down. I'm, I'm tweeting it. I'm posting on Facebook. Get 50 likes. And nothing happens. I didn't joyfully embrace the truth that I knew with faith in my heart. And so I wasn't living it out. I had, I had no passion. I, I, loved, I loved information. I, I loved information. I, I loved facts, right? I, I, I loved knowing what Jesus has done for me, but, but that was it. Because it kind of made me, it honestly just made me a little bit arrogant, right? Because then I could tell people, oh, is that what you're struggling with? Well, let me tell you what Jesus does, right? And frankly, I was just busy with a whole bunch of other stuff that was more important. I was a really smart, or not I was, still am, a really smart, educated, spiritual toddler. And the writer of Hebrews talks about this disobedience in chapter 3. Uh, a, a couple weeks we, we talked about, a couple weeks ago. In verse 18 through 19, he says, the reason for disobedience is a lack of belief. A lack of belief in the promises of God. See, he was, he's talking about ancient, he was talking about Israel, right? And so we, we know the story that God leads them out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage, and he, he tells them, look, I promised your forefathers Abraham that I would give them a land. I promised them I would bless the nations through you. 
So he leads them out. And if anyone knew or was exposed to the word of God, it was, it was Israel, right? I mean, they had, they had written word. They had prophets that God would send them. They knew it. And so they knew all this stuff. But they still found the patterns of sin. They still built idols and followed other things. If anyone knew who the Messiah was going to be or what he was going to look like, right? what he was going to do, how he was going to draw all people to himself, it would have been them. And then Jesus came and most of them ignored him, put him to death. And they missed it. And so the obvious question now is, so what do we do, right? How do we battle this? We know it's not normal for us to stay this way. If, if you are, if you're past this, Nicole, you can check out the rest of the message. But if you're going to be honest, I think a lot of us can identify with some of this. And we know the law of the universe is that if you're not growing, you're probably dying. How do we grow? The first step, honestly, would just be to actually get into the Word. Um, this wasn't in my notes when I was, or my my transcript and my outline when I was writing it but this morning. God was like, look, before you get into this, are you actually even reading the word? Are you actually praying? Are, are, are you actually sipping on this milk that I, that I have? Actively living in a Christian community. And then after this, is the first step is to do the opposite, really, of dull hearing, right? So the opposite of dull hearing is to be diligent in your hearing, right? To be diligent means to actively, actively listen to the Word of God, um, not passively hearing it, right? And so, so what this might look like is, is, is sometimes people take notes, right? Or, or you journal. It means that you think about and you chew on what, is, what you hear or what you read, um, what's preached from the stage, what you read in your scriptures. Um, and, and you let it transform how you live. It means that as soon as you walk out of these doors, um, you don't just check out, right? Uh, you, you don't say, that's good, Bryce, good job. And you walk out and completely forget it. But it might mean that um, as we're eating pizza, that you actually talk about this, talk about where you failed and what it means like to actually live it out. I mean, law stands for living our faith together, right? To be completely honest, to be diligent, means to actually take the gospel seriously. To take it seriously, because a lot of times we just don't. Like, again, we know what Jesus has done. We know who we are in Jesus. And then we don't care besides the knowledge. That we know that the gospel is not just good advice, right? It's not just good advice. It's good news. It's the very message that God reveals to reveal um, himself and to save us from, from, from damnation, and to save us into a life that has purpose, that has meaning, that glorifies God. So it glorifies the creator of the universe. In fact, these words have life. So many men have died to get this word into your hands, in the books or in your, on your smartphones. They're the very words that God chose to reveal himself and his word to us. And so the first uh, step to actually maturing, to be actually diligently Listen to the words spoken and the word that you read. And so then what should happen as we approach the word with earnestness, as we approach the word in uh, expectancy? Our lives are changed as we encounter the word of God, right? The active word of God, specifically the revelation of Jesus and the gospel that he brings. He says, for solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good for evil. So th th those who mature are those who actually practice righteousness, or practice doing good, rather, doing what they have learned. And by constant practice, and practicing righteousness, we learn what honors God and what doesn't honor God. What, what, what's beginning to happen in this audience is becoming, when he says, uh, verse 14, uh, 14, distinguishing good from evil, a lot of it has kind of become hazy, right? Um, things that weren't explicitly stated uh, within the law, or within the Ten Commandments, they're just like, well, do we do this or do we not? Is, is this... Is this really sinful or is it not? Is, is there grace in this? And we start living lives of righteousness once we live out our, uh, our, our, our beliefs that reflect our righteousness that is found in Jesus. And now, um, hear me in this. What, what I'm not saying is that uh, we do righteous, or our righteousness is what 
um, gains our favor in, in God. Um, you'll never hear that up here. Um, in fact, we, we know that. Um, but the Bible is pretty clear that if you follow Jesus, if you're in Jesus, what will happen, what is supposed to happen, is you live life, a life that, that pleases God, that pleases Jesus, that, that reflects the gospel, the good news in you. We do good news, uh, we do good deeds because it reflects who we are. And so we serve the needy because we know that Jesus met us in our neediness and in our filth, and he became a servant to us. And so we forgive others because, you know, 70 times 7, because we know that Jesus has forgiven us. And so we forgive even those that we think don't deserve forgiveness. And we live on mission. We live as, as reconcilers, as, as ministers of reconciliation, because we realize that we are not citizens of this world, but we're citizens of an eternal kingdom where we're not the kings, Jesus is. And we actually live in biblical communities because Christian life was never meant to be lived alone. It was meant to be lived in community where we're lifting up one another and growing. And we root out and we kill the sin that, 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 that's attacking us because we know that in Jesus, our, our sin natures have died. And so we put to death the sin nature that tries to overpower us, that tries to take, take, take its place back. And we actively engage in that. The gospel reveals that we're all sinners. But its promise is that we don't have to stay that way. So we hear the mark of a mature believer is that they actively apply the truth that they know. That we actually do it. Right? We actually obey Jesus. What a novel concept. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we actually begin to live differently. And as we hear and respond to the Word of God, our capacity for hearing and responding to the Word of God grows. That's when we actually begin maturing. That's when we actually begin taking in um, mature teaching. And thus solid food, heavy truth is for, the mature, is for the mature because maturity increases your capacity for greater truths. And when this process stops, so does the growing process. Because as long as we're hearing and responding, we're growing. And so finally we get to chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. Um, and the writer of Hebrews urges us on to maturity by... Um, and this is one more thing. He says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and move on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God and of instruction about washings, laying on of hands of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now, what he's not saying is that we move past the gospel, right? It's not, not saying that we move past Jesus. In fact, his entire purpose of writing Hebrews is that you don't move past Jesus. You stay on Jesus. But, but what was going on uh, is you had this group of believers that they were coming in every week and repenting of the same things every week, right? They're like, oh, does Jesus really love me? Am I really saved? And so they repent, and they're like, okay, we've got to trust in God. And then the, the word here, it, it, it's ceremonial washing. It's not even baptisms, right? Uh, or baptism. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's these Jewish cleansing rites. So they're like, okay, well, well, how do we fix ourselves? How do we fix ourselves? Okay, so that, that's true. They, then there, there, there were, they, were obs- they were obsessed with... with um, you know, when's, um, okay, well, when are we finally going to be, okay, when is Jesus returning? Uh, the resurrection of the dead. Eschatology is not my thing. Eschatology is like, like what happens in the end times. All I know is Jesus is coming. If you know when he's coming, um, then you're a smarter man than Jesus because Jesus said he, he, he even he didn't know. But uh, the only the Father did. But he's saying, look, you, you don't get bogged down in this. And not that these things aren't important. Not that repentance isn't, isn't important. It is. It's incredibly important. But that those should be our foundation upon which to grow. It's incredibly easy to get sucked into a cycle of habitual sins that we never just fully get over, right? That we never fully move past. We come in week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out. And we look, and there's no sense of urgency in us. Saying, let's practice the elementary truths and get them down so we can move on. Spiritual growth is normative and expected of the believer. Of Jesus. It's not an option. And so as we come to a close, the question we've got to ask ourselves is, how are we responding to Jesus? Because the easy thing to do, the, 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 to be tempted with, is to create, okay, well, if what I'm supposed to be doing is by actively living out of faith, well, let me create a list of, of what I'm supposed to do, right? The things that I'm supposed to do, things I'm not supposed to do, um, and, and create a list. And, but, but, you know, quiet time, check. 
Um, my tithing, check. You know, community groups, community service, check and check. But the proper response to God is not creating a checklist. Um, God showed us this when he gave us the law and gave us the Ten Commandments, that, that, that that's not what grows, or that that's not what compels us to grow in him more. When we respond to Jesus, it, 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 are, are, are we doing it in love or in grudging submission? Ugh, fine, Jesus. You want me to do this? Fine, I'll, I'll do it. It's, it's, it's in love. If our response looks like the latter, then perhaps we have a problem with being dull of hearing. We're not listening with faith. We're not listening with love. And we don't obey with joy and hope. Right? Is, is, is Jesus our greatest passion? We, we sing it week in and week out. And, and, and we say it, but, but is he really the one thing that our hearts long for? Is he, is he the, our greatest treasure? Do you believe that he is worth living and dying for? Every week the message that's proclaimed here is that the gospel changes everything, right? It, it changes everything, that, that we are new creatures, uh, citizens of a heavenly kingdom, ministers of reconciliation. And so are we just sipping on milk, content with where we're at, content with being infants, week in and week out, never fully growing, looking the same you do today like you did when you first started following Jesus? Or are we actively practicing righteousness, living out the power of the Holy Spirit? And, and, and maybe you're at a place where you're like, Bryce, I just, I just don't feel it. I mean, it was good at first, and now, not, not, now I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just at a standstill. My encouragement to you would be to come to the Word and to pray, to pray that the Holy Spirit revives your heart. And that when you hear these words, it's not met with a hardened heart, that, that, that they come alive that he empowers you to actually live on mission. The scripture makes it clear that Jesus is our greatest passion, our greatest treasure. And we strive for obedience to the word of God that centers on him. We, we practice righteousness to glorify him because we are his children. That if we are Christians, we are to be hearing and responding and living out the truth that we know. This morning, um, we have a chance to uh, actually um, reflect this. Um, here at Loft, we, we have communion every Sunday. Um, and the way we do it um, is we recognize that it is a symbol of a spiritual reality. Right? Um, and so, so, so we don't think that these are, 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 are magical crackers or pieces of bread. or, or, or mag it's, it's, it's crackers, gold, maybe goldfish, and some juice. Right, um, but what it is is it represents something totally different. Right, it represents that Jesus looked down upon earth, upon creation, knowing that that in all our best efforts we could not please the holy God of the universe. We cannot keep a list of rules or commandments. Right, and so what he did is he came down, he put on flesh, and he lived the righteous life that we are supposed to live, and he died an unjust death so that we may be reconciled to him. And so in that truth, we are new creations, church. Brothers and sisters, we, we, are, are, are not the, we, we are not as we were. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. Pray with me. So before I pray, let me say something real quick. Uh, if, if you're new to Loft, um, the, the way we do it is, the band's going to be singing up here. Um, and as you pray, I pray that, that, that the Holy Spirit would, again, move you to maturity. But as you're dealing uh, with yourself, um, as you feel led, as you feel compel compelled, um, you can walk over and partake of the elements. You can grab uh, a cracker. You can grab... Um, a little cup of juice uh, and, and bring it back to your seat and then once everyone's partaken we'll, we'll take it together um, and in this we'll recognize the sacrifice of Jesus we'll recognize our position in him that our righteousness is not in ourselves but it's in the holy work of Christ let's pray Father, we recognize that 
we stink at this, God. God, uh, that we are stuck in states of spiritual infancy. We should be growing, should be maturing, Lord God. But, 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 but we just get lazy a lot of times, God. I get lazy a lot of times. Father, would you remind us, Lord, of who we are if we are in Jesus? And if we are his own, Lord God, that, that he loves us so deeply, Lord. That he died for us, Lord God, that, that he died, Lord, so that we might have actually communion with you, God. We might have fellowship with you. I pray, Lord God, that, that this, that the reality, Lord God, that's symbolized here, Lord God, will come alive in our hearts, God. We walk out these doors and walk into the world as changed people, God. As people on mission, as people who live their faith out, God. Not as hypocrites who just hear and don't live, but as true sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father. 